Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're joining us from. And welcome to today's webinar, Hemp Certification, Introducing USHA Certification with PGRFSA. My name is Amy. I'm a member of the marketing team at the Perry Johnson Companies, and I'll be helping to facilitate today's webinar and offer technical support to our speakers. Today, we're welcoming a special guest, Dr. Mariel Weintraub, the president of USHA, as well as Brett McMillan, the Hemp and Cannabis Division Manager here at PGRFSI. And I'll be introducing both of them to you momentarily. But just before we get started, I wanted to remind all of our attendees that you will be on mute for the duration of the session to ensure audio quality and adequate bandwidth for our presenters. However, we absolutely do want to take any questions that you might have regarding the material discussed. Um, two of the most common questions we get are regarding the availability of the slides and whether or not the broadcast is being recorded. Um, I'm happy to say that our slides from today's presentation will be available for download from the PGRFSI website, and we are indeed recording the session. So anyone who is unable to join us, or if you have to leave early, or maybe you even want to share the recording with a colleague, um, you'll be able to watch the, with the voiceover and the full Q&A free of charge on the PGRFSI YouTube channel. Just give us about 24 to 48 hours to upload that recording, and it'll be available for review. And as I mentioned, we do absolutely encourage any questions you might have, whether it's specifically regarding uh, the U.S. Hemp Authority, PGRFSI, um, any other certification aspect of cannabis and hemp, we do encourage you to ask those questions. We'll be saving them for the end, but you don't have to wait to ask your questions. To ask your question, you can go right into the control panel on your screen. It should look something like this. There should be a tab that says questions or question and answer. If you open that tab up, it'll have a space for you to type your question and then just click the send button. And as I said, we'll get those on our side and we will address them at the end of the prepared presentation after Brett and Marielle's discussion. But now without any further ado, I wanna go ahead and introduce uh, Brett McMillan. Brett has been in the certification and quality world for over 13 years. Inside the cannabis space, Brett has worked to develop industry accredited programs for CGMP. GACP, uh, the USDA Organic Programs, and other US ISO based programs. Uh, as our program manager, Brett has worked with numerous state regulators to assist and educate entities on the wording, implementation, and execution of their important product safety and quality requirements through programs like GMP certification. Uh, in addition, Brett has been in the trenches, so to speak, with growers, extractors, manufacturers, and producers through these programs. These experiences have led to speaking engagements at numerous conferences around the United States. And I believe, Brett, you have a couple coming up this year uh, throughout the last five years or so. And in his spare time, Brett likes camping, fly fishing, snowboarding, and all of that great outdoor stuff. So Brett, I'm gonna hand things over to you and you can take it, take it away and tell us a little bit about PGFSI. Well, thanks, Amy. I appreciate the gracious uh, introduction there and uh, welcome everybody to this webinar. We're pretty excited to uh, talk about our new partnership with United States Hemp Authority um, and also talk with Marielle about that. But yeah, Perry Johnson Registrar's Food Safety, we are part of a uh, global group. And Amy, I'm not sure if I'm able to uh, admit, there we go. Um, so who, who is Perry Johnson? Who are the Perry Johnson companies? We are, we're part of a family of companies under the Perry Johnson umbrella. And we are a global certification body for numerous types of ISO standards on a global level. Some of you listening in may be familiar with ISO 9001, medical devices, aerospace, things like that, as well as Perry Johnson Registrar's Food Safety. We are a globally recognized certification body for all major food safety standards. And about five years ago, we started getting a lot of requests from the uh, hemp and the CBD world for good manufacturing practices audits or GMP audits. And the cannabis industry has now caught up with that. And so relative to hemp and CBD and industrial hemp, we do have uh, an ANSI and ANAV accredited program to recognize those GMP uh, services. And so really it does boil down to quality, you know, uh, not just being an act, it is a habit. And with the companies that we're working with and the partnerships that we have, by bringing quality to the table, it's going to bring safer products out there into the marketplace, not just for cannabis and hemp, but food, medical devices, anything on that level. And so the longer I've worked with Perry Johnson and I've, I've met 
clients and manufacturers globally, I realize how important it is to really know what you're making, how well it's being made, and to keep those things safe for our, our kids and our, our customers. Um, as a third party certification body, we would come in and do a certain type of audit, uh, depending on what industry you're in relative to hemp, that could be a GMP audit, it could be an ISO 9001 audit, and for our discussion today with the U.S. Hemp Authority, it can also be part of the U.S. Hemp Authority or the USHA's uh, certification program for those products and being able to put the USHA logo on those products going out into the, into the public. Um, so what are the benefits of becoming certified, right? Um, obviously, you're gonna lower the odds of a recall. You're gonna mitigate risks to public health and safety. You're going to be able to promote your products and know that your company is doing the right thing by having a certification audit. Your customers are going to have confidence in what they're purchasing, um, where they're purchasing it. And quite frankly, in terms of the financial portion of all this, it's going to help the value of your company. It's going to help companies stay ahead of their competition. And we've also over the last few years received calls from some pretty big player insurance companies that are looking to insure companies that only have some kind of a GMP or some kind of an ISO certificate in place because those insurance companies want to lower their risk, which I found pretty interesting. So that's, you know, that's kind of a, an overview of, of why certification is important. And another thing is that certification is um, on an up and coming level being mandated in certain states with certain big box customers and things at that level that we can talk to Marielle about in terms of her experiences in, in the industry with that. Other things that we can we can talk about also further, um, but you know, in a nutshell, how are you going to be ready for an audit uh, from the USHA program or any other type of certification program? But specifically for the for what we're talking about today with the USHA and their uh, GMP style checklist, you wanna know what you're being audited to, right? You wanna obviously have the checklist, you wanna review that with your team, and typically that would be done via an internal audit, which also can be done at the same time with a pre-assessment. And that's really just kind of a gut check of, okay, we've re reviewed the checklist, we've talked with this about our employees, We've been honest with ourselves about what our shortcomings are, what we may need to fix, what we may need to bring in a private third party consultant to have us put these things in place. Have we invested in a software or a documentation program to help with what we're managing? So that's how you get ready for an audit. You review the checklist, you understand what the requirements are, you train your employees as needed, you do an official internal audit, and really, you know, we get a lot of questions about, you know, what is an internal audit? It's just that somebody on your team, not the certification body, not PGRFSI, not USHA, but somebody on your internal team or a privately hired third party would come in and do a, an internal audit and a dry run of that checklist. And when that internal audit is done, you have to show that you've basically issued corrective actions to yourself and you've made a plan, usually in writing, of how you're going to implement those corrective actions. And so once you've gone through that process, that's when you're ready to have us come in to do the official audit. Another thing uh, that's important to consider with timing is you can still sign up for any of these programs, even if you're not ready for the audit, because by going under contract and committing to the process, you are then in the matrix to be scheduled for an audit. So if you know that your goal is to have your USHA audit, um, let's say the first week of July arbitrarily, then now's the time to get signed up for that. Now's the time to commit to the process because if you wait till you go through all these requirements that we're talking about to be audit ready, we're already gonna be booked out months in advance past that. So it's very important to work with the, the timing strategy to be honest with your team about what your goals are and, and when you're gonna be ready. So that, that's a very important um, part that comes up quite a bit in our, in our certification process. Also, once you go under contract with PGRFSI, 
for the USHA program and any one of our other programs, we will give you what's called a pending letter of certification that shows that you've committed to becoming a USHA partner. Oh, excuse me. And so once you have that in hand, you can use that to help um, market to your folks and your customers that you're uh, in process of becoming certified and show to the world that you're um, on track to make those things happen. Sometimes that can be good enough for a potential customer. Sometimes it at least shows that you're in process of making those things happen. So that's kind of an overview of the process. I'm gonna slide this uh, next slide forward to uh, Marielle. Um, and Amy, I didn't know if you wanted to do a, an introduction for Marielle, but um, Dr. Weintraub is president of the US Hemp Authority. Uh, we're excited to be working with her and, and her team. Um, the US Hemp Authority is a nonprofit organization that has a very specific checklist and requirements to be able to use the logo that you see on this slide. And Perry Johnson Registrar of Food Safety, PJR FSI, we're proud to now be the official certification body for the US Hemp Authority. So when folks yeah. are coming on board, <laughs> I'm gonna, will... I'll jump in really quick, Brett. Okay. I have the rest of uh, Marielle's uh, introduction here. As oh, great. Brett had Thank mentioned. You. Yeah, no worries. Uh, as Brett had mentioned, Dr. Marielle Weintraub is, is a founding mo board member and the current president of the USHA. Um, and as Brett had mentioned, and I'm sure most of you are aware just from reading the notes on our uh, webinar description when you registered, the USHA certification program is the hemp industry's initiative to provide high standards, best practices, and self-regulation to increase consumer and regulator confidence in the hemp industry. Uh, Dr. Weintraub's role in the USHA is a voluntary position and she continues to support the cannabis market every day in her career as a director of scientific strategy for OTC and contaminants testing at Eurofins FCT Madison. So, Marielle, thank you so much for taking the time to be on this webinar with us today. And we always, as of course, we appreciate your expertise. So I'll let you take the take the wheel if you wanted to go through your little uh, broad strokes overview of the USHA and what you guys are all about. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much um, for that introduction. And Brett, thank you for going over uh, what Perry Johnson um, has to offer. Um, and we are very excited to be partnering with y'all um, as we continue to grow this program uh, alongside the hemp industry. So for those of you who don't know about the U.S. Hemp Authority, um, I'll give you a brief history of us. So way back in 2016, which basically feels like a lifetime, I like to joke that hemp years are kind of like dog years for everyone, it's like seven. Um, but in 2016, the Kentucky Hemp Industry Coalition uh, determined that a self-regulated organization was necessary for our industry. Um, an example of a different uh, self-regulated organization is the organic movement, um, now better known as USDA Organic. Same idea. Um, so what we did is we hired an expert to help us develop this process, um, and we formed a grassroots organization. So in 2017, uh, the Kentucky Hemp Industry Coalition actually became the U.S. Hemp Roundtable. Um, and established a formal process to develop a guidance plan um, where we could develop a um, self-regulating organization and process to help support the growers, uh, the cultivators, processors, and brand owners in this up-and-coming industry. In 2018, um, because the U.S. Hemp Roundtable's main focus is lobbying for the hemp industry, we decided to create a sister organization and founded the U.S. Hemp Authority. So originally it was seed funded by the uh, Hemp Roundtable. We are separate organizations um, and we continue to grow alongside each other, relying on the Roundtable for lobbying, but being the certification body for the hemp industry. You do not have to be a part of the Roundtable to have the certification um, on your product or on your farm or as a part of your manufacturing. Um, it got very exciting in 2019. It is when our first round of certifications were being done. The original um, 13 seals were given out in March of 2019. Uh, and almost immediately, we started to ask the industry for their opinion 
um, what needed to be better, what could we grow, what could we change, and based off industry guidance, we then developed what we call 2.0. Um, we are continuing to grow alongside this industry. This industry is continuing to evolve. So in 2020, we had further updates and revisions made to the guidance, uh, resulting in what we call 3.0. Um, and some of that included a glossary. So what we noticed is that they, there was a, a lack of unifying industry vocabulary um, in, the hemp, in the hemp world. Um, and so what we wanted to do was uh, create this glossary. And then we actually teamed up with APA, um, the American Herbal Products Association, who was also developing a um, uh, so there, I think they refer to it as their, uh, ooh, I forgot what it's called. It's their version of the glossary. Um, and what we're able to do is we actually have identical industry terminology when um, possible. Theirs is a published document, so you can find it. It is on their website. And what you'll see on our website um, in our glossary is reference to theirs as well, whenever possible. Um, the more unity we have, the easier it's going to be to grow as an industry. Um, in 2021, we decided to expand our board, um, and we added people. Um, one person is ex-DEA. Uh, we added um, a former attorney general of Arkansas. We have a former executive from GNC. We have ex-FDA. And what I actually think is most important um, is that we added additional representatives from trade organizations. Um, related to the cannabis industry. In this case, right now, the, the person sits uh, in that spot. It's from the Center of, for Responsible Nutrition, CRN. Um, and we also have spots for farming organizations. Right now, that spot is filled by someone from the Texas Hemp Coalition. So making sure that industry is working with us, making sure that related trade industries are working with us is how we continue to grow and become stronger. Um, and then in 2023, we have joined forces with uh, PJRFSI, and they are our official third-party certification body, which is incredibly exciting for us if you see the history and the credibility of the certification group. So the question I think I get most of all is what is the value of being certified? Why do this? Why do this voluntary certification and it's really important to call out that our program is the hemp initiative, is the hemp industry's initiative to provide high standards, best practices, and self-regulation. We need to give consumers and retailers confidence in hemp and CBD products. This is becoming even more important as FDA continues to uh, push out and change how they plan on um, allowing hemp and CBD to be everywhere in the market. Um, and what we're doing here is we're giving you a way to show your consumers and show the, the groups and the retailers why they should pick you over others. Um, and I think that has been really the game changer and why there's so many brand owners and manufacturers who are interested in this deal. So I do want to point out that the hemp industry um, and the U.S. Hemp Authority are working together. So it's an industry-led initiative. Um, we help exemplify truth in labeling. It goes beyond the CGMPs because it is very hemp-specific. What makes hemp risky? Um, we know that it's a, um, a bioaccumulator. So if you plant hemp in land that's high in pesticide or high in heavy metals, you can't dilute those out. So understanding the risks of hemp is what makes our certification so strong. Um, we help, uh, uh, because of our label reviews, it helps improve integrity. Um, and we do require specific testing. What's interesting is we have tried to understand what the, what the states are doing and stay in front of the state regulations. And you will notice that our requirements for testing are very similar to some of the states like New York, Colorado, California. Um, and it's because there are people on our board, including myself, who actually work with these states, which allows us to stay a bit ahead of the curve in our requirements. So we want to help you build your brand's credibility. 
Um, back in 2016, there were far fewer um, cannabinoid products on the market. How do you differentiate yourself? How can you show customers that you can be trusted, that you're authentic, that you aren't synthetic, you are plant-based cannabinoids? Um, how can you make sure they understand that you have a quality assurance program and that your labels are being transparent to them? And this is one way that we are able to help support your companies on this market um, that has tons and tons of brands that have magically popped up over the last three years. And so being able to help you build public trust in your brand is our goal. And so Brett, I will pass this back over to you um, where we can, I think we, we planned on, I'm pretty sure we have a couple of questions that have come in from what I can tell. Yeah, Amy, if we, we can either jump to the questions that have, that have come in or I, I had a couple conversational questions first, uh, Dr. Weintraub, just to, could you, I, I know the FDA just had kind of a ruling, no ruling of, of CBD and products and things like that. And, and, you know, there's kind of some confusion out there. Can you just give like a, a bird's eye view of, of what the FDA said but didn't say in terms of cbd and maybe we can just kind of bounce off of that yes so um the not nice way of saying it is that the fda kind of kicked the can down the road on when it comes to when it comes to regulations i actually found it incredibly fascinating that the first thing they did was said that their current dietary supplement uh regulations were not strong enough um, in this case, they didn't want CBD to fall under or other cannabinoids um, to fall under uh, 111 or 117 in the food industry um, because of some of what they refer to as risks. Um, the Hemp Authority took a very strong stand back in, I believe it was 2019 when we started to see things like Delta 8 on the market and other purposefully uh, intoxicating cannabinoids. Um, and you'll notice I use the term intoxicating versus psychoactive. I have a PhD in neuroscience and anything that changes any behavior is psychoactive. So there is a difference between psychoactive and intoxicating. Um, but what I want to make sure people understand is we took a stand against the intoxicating cannabinoids, not because we wanted to hurt farmers and not because we had a grudge against, let's say, the high THC cannabis industry. It's that we understand that there was meant to be a difference in the farm bill between industrial hemp and high THC cannabis. Um, so adult or recreational use, depending on where you are, or med. Um, and we understand that there is that risk added. So if you're going to have an intoxicating product, there needs to be a difference in what's required on the label. That's why it's governed by each state and the state allows for certain amounts and they, they require certain regulations and they require certain statements on your label. We took a stand against synthetics. We took a stand against intoxicating because it's not how we got the farm bill passed in the first place. It's not how we're gonna be allowed to be in everyday products like food. Um, and so making sure that we stick to the non-intoxicating cannabinoids and making sure we stick to non-synthetic cannabinoids is also protecting the farmers. Um, and so what FDA did was say that the current regulations aren't strong enough and they're going to need to develop an entirely different way um, of regulating these products based on certain risks. I don't necessarily agree with them I agree that if you look at something that I would consider not hemp, let's say Delta 8, the 111 and 117 are not strong enough for it. They're just not. But if you're looking at something like uh, CBD or full spectrum or broad spectrum extracts, the current 111 would cover those products as long as manufacturers are following those current good manufacturing processes. Okay, and, and for those of you that are that are tuned in that may not be familiar with some of these acronyms, as, as Dr. Weintraub was mentioning, 111 is CFR 111, which is typically geared towards uh, dietary supplements. So, you know, 
And what is CBD? Is it a dietary supplement? Is it a food? Is it a drug? That to me, just on a street level, seems to be a, a, a never ending um, uh, debate. And I, I don't know if that is ever going to be answered, if the FDA needs to put that in a certain category, but, um, you know, only time will tell. Um, Amy, did you have a couple, any of the questions that came in through the, through the webinar that you wanted to put out there? I do, yeah. So this is a question for Marielle. Um, I know you had mentioned earlier in the presentation when you were going over USHA's uh, positions and how you work with entities to develop your program, um, you had mentioned specifically working with certain states. Are there any, uh, you know, municipalities, state governments, any kind of um, special recognition from any state or local, I don't know, uh, governments regarding USHA certification, you know, where it kind of gives you a free pass as, you know, you re recognize the USHA, or is there any aim for that to become the goal with USHA certification? Yes, so it, there is nothing in stone yet. There are three specific states that we have been talking to um, where they have positioned the U.S. Hemp Authority certification to look similar to a supplier verification program. Um, when you are selling products, but you don't live in that state, how is that state supposed to monitor and audit you the same way they would those that live that are being manufactured or or produced in this state. So take for instance, the state of New York has requirements for those uh, for testing um, for everyone, but they also have additional requirements of licensing uh, for, for companies in the state of New York. So how can they be sure that someone, let's say that's based in California and selling in New York are following the same regulations that they require of their own companies in that state? And so looking uh, at uh, USHA and other certifications as a way to um, create a supplier verification program for out of state um, has been more and more common, um, especially now that FDA has kind of moved the goal line again. Kick kicking that can down the figurative road as, as Brett put it. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so here's a question for both of you, um, and I obviously you could give either side of your 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 perspective here. What is the process, would you say, for say we have a, an FSI existing client who's interested in USHA certification, or vice versa, USHA certified client who's also interested in PGFSI certification? Is there I know, and I know with ISO certifications, there's a way to kind of meld different certificates together for auditing purposes. How, what's the interplay like with uh, USHA certification and other options on the on the market for certification? I think I can jump in on that real quick, Amy, at least on our end. So if anybody listening to, as part of this webinar in the future as part of a recording is interested in the USHA program, you would want to go to the USHA website and review their checklist, review all of their resources and information. And we are teamed up with the USHA. So when it comes time to get an actual quote for certification and to make that process happen, you would be linked up with Harry Johnson and we would put that process together for you. You would actually have, you would be issued a certificate through Perry Johnson that in conjunction with USHA has the logo on it and shows what type of program you've been uh, basically approved for through the USHA. And, um, and, and Dr. Weintraub, you can jump in on this obviously anytime, but you, know, you could be a brand owner and a brand owner is basically, you're not making anything yourself. You have private label manufacturers making your products for you based on your own recipe, or based on a certain type of product that you wanna have out there. And so you can have a brand owner certification where we review your labels, your uh, products and, and who is making those products and are they meeting certain standards to know that there's a clean product. You can also be a processor where you actually are processing the hemp yourself, doing the extraction, making the different oils, or you're bringing the oil in and then formulating and making your own products. So you can also be a processor, and then you could technically also be a farmer um, and go through good agricultural practices certification, things of that nature. So whatever your, your touch point is in the hemp industry, um, the USHA has different levels that you can be involved. And um, 
that's what's great about this program because you could already be a CBD producer right now. You could already have a GMP certificate in place from a company other than Perry Johnson that's a reputable company, and you can still come on board with the USHA. Perry Johnson would just review your existing certificate, review your existing program, and do what's called a desk audit, and then issue the USHA certificate to you. So if there's folks out there listening to this, um, you don't necessarily have to uh, you know, leave the company that you're with to be with USHA. We're the managing partner and the official certification body that helps manage all this for the USHA. Did I explain that well enough? Uh, Dr. Weinfeld, for my oh, no, Absolutely. So it was always intended the USHA is very, very um, focused on hemp risk and uh, hemp products and testing risk. Um, so having a group um, like PJRFSI that does your, your GMP audit for you, or if you are already using a reputable um, GMP auditor, adding it to that to show your interest in specifically what makes hemp risky is what the certification was built for. Let me, let me ask you this. Um, what... What is the USHA version like in Europe or other countries? Are you seeing any sort of global collaboration of what's happening in the United States or learning from other countries of how they handle CBD and hemp and what it's looked like globally compared to what the FDA is dealing with here in the United States? Sure, so yes. there are some, very, very few certifications overseas, mostly um, EU or UK based. Um, but, and up until a few years ago, we were very neck and neck about how we were looking at these products and whether or not, um, they would be allowed for certain, for, to be allowed to be used in certain um, products. Mm -hmm. So for instance, FDA never came out negatively against cannabinoids in cosmetics. They were not pro, but they also were not anti. Um, and so you would see big organizations like pharmacies willing to sell um, cosmetic-like uh, products or topicals if they were able to get an OTC designation, over-the-counter designation. Um, in Europe, um, and now let's say in Israel, has pulled ahead um, of us because they have approved the use of cannabinoids or CBD in food. Um, showing its safety levels um, and an understanding there for, for its uses to be positive for, um, for, their, for the people who live there. Um, and so we, there are some similarities in some of the groups that are overseas. Um, we have actually seen, instead of using the overseas certification, we have seen groups that get the US Hemp Authority certification and keep it on their products overseas. Um, so that was really exciting to see just based on the strength of the certification and based on the strength of what we asked those who are certified to do um, to show that the products that they are selling um, are quality, uh, are of a quality, a quality nature and are very careful about testing and understand the risks that having these specific plant-based um, compounds how that changes how they test. Um, so there are other certifications out there, um, but we've actually seen ours being used overseas as opposed to that certification being used. Great. And Interesting the perspective. I've got a question here from the audience. It's a bit of a two-parter, so bear with me. Um, we have a question. Um, you mentioned that the testing regulations for USHA certification are similar to, ca to California, Colorado, New York, et cetera. Uh, what are the testing and sampling requirements for the certification and where is it available to be reviewed? Uh, second part of the question, um, how should labs best prepare to test for the full panel and how will methods or MU be specified? Um, so if you go to our website, which is ushempauthority.org, you can click on, there's a banner around across the top um, and it says uh, you can review the 4.0 guidance. So it's our guidance documents. Uh, it is split up by brand owner, manufacturer or farmer. Um, so you would go to your section and it will list 
the testing and our suggestions for that testing and where to find it. Um, so we call out things like the AOAC method for testing cannabinoids because the CFR calls out um, the yeah, AOAC test methods um, when you have the ability to use those. Um, we do give you the opportunity to either test with FDA BAM um, or to use other pesticide methods depending on what you're most comfortable with and what the requirements in your state are. So hemp has a, for those of you in the industry know that there's this patchwork of regulations coming from different states um, in, in addition to federal regulations, so even though FDA doesn't think 111 for supplements or 117 for food are strong enough, um, that was still the basis of what we originally used to develop these hemp testing programs because we do believe in their strength um, for non-intoxicating um, compounds. So understanding that we do call out certain um, methodologies, we require heavy metal testing, uh, almost every state's going to require the big four, so that's lead, mercury, cadmium, and arsenic. Um, we also require mycotoxin testing, which are the aflatoxins and anoprotoxin, as well as total. Um, and so we have set up our requirements to match um, probably some of the harder of the patchwork of state regulations. Um, and have called out certain areas where you can go find those methods. When you're speaking to your lab, um, let's say you're in the state of California, or sorry, Colorado, you have a, not, an entire layer there that isn't, uh, let's say, a part of California because you have tests that have qualified under the state of Colorado or CDPHE. So you'll have to make sure you are using one of those approved testing labs and then following the requirements of CDPHE, which are very similar to uh, the requirements of the US Temp Authority. We do allow for slight changes in the case that your state requires it. So state will be considered the way for you to be certified if the USHA certification lists something slightly different than your state. Um, so that would be something you'd work with the auditors with. So from PJRFSI, what you would tell them is this is what the certification says to do. We understand that. This is what the state says to do. You should be following your state. Um, and so we are okay with slight changes. We are evolving. It's not perfect. And because of this patchwork of state regulations, it is very, very hard to constantly have these lists that are ever changing available. So understanding your state regulations are important um, and just realize that the Hemp Authority certification regulations were built to follow along the various states, knowing there would be a difference. Yeah, if I can also jump in too. So what's great about the USHA checklist and also behind the scenes, what FSI has in place for a GMP program is the concept of it being a harmonized standard or a harmonized checklist, meaning no matter what state you're in, this is a very good program and is going to cover all the major bases of what you would expect to, you know, have in a program as robust as USHA. So on top of that, whatever state you're in, if there's other, um, you know, uh, interpretations or curveball requirements above and beyond what a USHA certificate would cover, we will make sure along with you the customer knowing what the regulations are to add those as kind of a module or a merit badge to the USHA program so that you're you're basically covered and there are companies listening to this webinar and companies that are part of uh, of the USHA that have multiple locations you could be you could have a manufacturing site in Florida and have another one in Colorado but your certificate will cover both those states and then we would focus on what those differences are um, and I also wanted to bring up for the testing portion, um, Dr. Weintraub, the importance of, um, which is brought up, is, is using a lab that's accredited to ISO 17025. Um, and, you know, full transparency, we do have a sister division called Perry Johnson Lab Accreditation, which is a global accrediting body for the ISO 17025 standard. So some of the folks that are tuned in here, your lab may already be accredited and you can add those different methods and those different tests within uh, the hemp industry. And, and many of those are very similar to what's going on in the cannabis world to what we, on the accreditation side, on the lab accreditation side, you know, there, there's kind of a, 
a what we would call a full panel accreditation where you know there's uh, you know potency residual solvents heavy metals pesticides and all the micros that you mentioned dr weintraub so you know i i think if a, if a lab is accredited or a lab is on their way to becoming accredited and has that kind of a an accredited level um that they would be able to handle those different types of test requirements is that is that fair to say dr weintraub uh, it is that other than the fact that we do require a 17025 um laboratory so we don't tell you who to use or who has to be who has to be the accrediting body for that 17025 um but we, because it is uh an iso accreditation um it is uh universal or very similar to um so we do call that out the difference there is in the state of colorado if there is an approved lab for colorado purposes you are allowed to use them there are labs under Colorado CDPHE that are 17025. Um, so just paying attention to that. It's also important to pay attention to not just the fact that a lab is 17025, but what, what methods that includes. Um, so the lab might be 17025 to test water. That doesn't mean they're accredited to test cannabinoids um, or pesticides or heavy metals. So paying attention to that and asking for that list um, would allow you to, to pick a lab in a more efficient manner. Yeah, that's a good point. So that's that's basically their scope of accreditation at that point, because you're right, a lab can say they're 17025 accredited, but unless you see their scope of what they're accredited for, it, it may not be the right testing service, you know, and, and as a client or a potential USHA, uh, member, that's definitely something to watch out for. And we're, we're very similar to that with the U.S. Hemp Authority certified um, seal, because there are companies out there that are going to make both cannabinoid products and let's say mainstream vitamins. Um, you can still get that Hemp Authority certification seal for your various products. We just can't certify your vitamin products. Um, there are companies out there who are going to sell both. Um, CBD, CBG, and other non-intoxicating cannabinoid products alongside, let's say, Delta-8. Um, you can still qualify for certification for your non-intoxicating products. We will not certify your Delta-8 product. Um, so we understand and we are actually very flexible. If you have questions, feel free to ask us. We both have email addresses. Um, if there are questions about what kind of products you can certify or who can get certified, um, feel free to send emails in. Um, we're happy to answer those. Yeah, absolutely. I was just about to encourage everyone, please keep those questions coming in. If you're a little shy or you know, maybe you have a question that's a little too personal or specific regarding your individual business, uh, as Marielle just said, please send those uh, questions in via email or give PageRFSI a call. Um, there's also just more information, as Marielle mentioned, the standard itself is available from the U.S. Hemp Authority website, which is right up on your screen. And if you download these slides, they will also be clickable links embedded for your convenience. Uh, we do have a follow-up question from the audience um, on a similar note to the one we just covered, uh, Marielle, um, regarding um, will measurement uncertainty LOQ, LOD for trace analytes, minor cannabinoids be addressed, and will sampling methods be addressed? Um, so that's a very excellent and interesting question. So we have actually um, addressed issues like LOQ, but very um, purposefully in our glossary. So it has to do with naming something like broad spectrum hemp extract. We expect for um, the LOQ of your Delta 9 THC to be below a certain amount, which is listed there. Um, I believe it's point uh, one percent. I would have to double check. Um, but it is listed there and it's very specific for the reason that we don't want someone calling a broad spectrum, someone calling a product broad spectrum extract, which theoretically would have had the THC removed, but setting um, their limit of detection to let's say 0.2%. That's not broad spectrum. Um, so we do take care of some of that information when it comes to pesticides right now, we're following EPA guidance. And when it comes to residual solvents, we're following USP 467, so they are limit tests. Um, that information should be in the guidance. Um, if you need further 
other information, you can email info at usmauthority.org and we can point you in the right direction. Um, when we can, we use AOAC methods because AOAC methods are peer reviewed methods and do take into account um, method uncertainty. All right, hopefully that answered that question thoroughly enough. If not, like I said, please do send in those questions. Um, I haven't seen any other audience questions come in, so I think we're safe to start wrapping up a little bit. Um, Mariel, I know we have plans down the line for some more webinar content and presentations, so we're looking forward to those. Um, did you wanna just give a brief overview though of what the process is for those who are interested in being certified to the US Hemp Authority certification standard? Sure, the easiest way is to go to our website. There are links if you wanna be certified. Um, but as Brett mentioned, I would uh, first look through the guidance documents um, and see if you're like, oh yeah, that's easy. Oh yeah, we've been doing that forever. Of course we have a quality assurance person. Of course we have training. Um, and then reach out if there are questions directly to P uh, PJR FSI or when you, when you go through the US Hemp Authority links on our website, it will send them a message. We purposely put a veil between the US Hemp Authority and our certifying body because we don't want people to not look into getting certified um, because they're scared someone they might know might see that they didn't make it um, or chose not to go through with it. So those questionnaires go directly to PJR FSI um, and that way you you can look into it without anyone else in the hemp industry knowing you're looking into it. This used to be a much bigger deal in 2016 when there were like 20 companies. Um, now, we probably don't know most of the people out there. Um, so it's a little bit less of an issue, but um, that's the easiest way to start looking into this is to go to our website and just follow those certification links. Great, thank you. All right, I didn't see any other new questions come in, so we will go ahead and start wrapping up. As I mentioned, we are planning on having a few more webinars in the future with USHA. So just stay tuned to our social media. If you're not already signed up for the PGRFSI uh, email mailing list, I absolutely encourage you to sign up for that. Uh, you can go to our website. The, the URL is right on your screen there, pgrfsi.com. If you scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, on the bottom left, there should be a field where you can insert your email address and just click subscribe and that will get you on our mailing list for all of our upcoming webinars, newsletters, um, any other information that you could desire from PGRFSI will come right to your inbox. Mariel, Brett, thank you both so much for taking the time for the webinar today. Any parting words of wisdom before we sign off? Um, only that I will be presenting at the um, NOCO 9 in Colorado Springs at the end of March. So if there are questions, you can find me there. And I'll be at that event also. So um, that's going to be a great event. If anybody's in the Colorado Springs area or, or you know, plans on coming out, that's that event is stacked with a lot of very talented, uh, very connected people in the hemp industry. And I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a great event. Sounds like Colorado Springs is going to be the place to be. All right. On that note, we will sign off for the day. I wish you all a great rest of your week. Stay safe and stay healthy out there, everyone. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.